Okay. So just want to make a few announcements again. Um, in this slide, you can see um, a few links. The first one is the mailing list where you will get detailed announcement of uh, each week's talk. Second one is YouTube channel where you can uh, watch the videos uh, of the talks every week. And we just joined Twitter and LinkedIn as well. So please um, follow us on Twitter and LinkedIn. All right, so let's get started. Hi, everyone. Welcome to our 14th session of the Met AI Group Exchange Sessions. Today, we are very happy to have Dr. Andre Esteva from Salesforce Research to talk about frontiers of medical AI from therapeutics and workflows. Andre is a researcher and entrepreneur in deep learning and computer vision. He currently serves as head of medical AI at Salesforce Research. Notably, he has led research efforts in AI-enabled medical diagnostics and therapeutic decision-making. Andre has worked at Google Research, Sandia National Labs, and GE Healthcare, and has co-founded two tech startups. He obtained his PhD in artificial intelligence at Stanford, where he worked with Sebastian Trun, Jeff Dean, Stephen Boyd, Fei-Fei Li, and Eric Topo. Thank you, Andrew, Andre, for joining us today. And before we start, do you have any preference about how you would like to take questions? Uh, well, first off, thanks, Steve, for, for the very nice introduction, for inviting me to be here. And thank you, everyone, for attending. Um, questions, uh, please ask questions as, as they come to mind. Don't wait until the end. Feel free to interrupt me and don't be shy. Uh, this is very much intended to be kind of a dialogue presentation. OK, great. So let's again, try to make this session as interactive as possible and feel free to ask questions. Without further ado, let me hand it over to Andre. All right, thank you. Let me share my screen here and we'll get started. Cool. I assume you guys can see this? Yep. Yes, we can. Is that a net? This will great. Okay. So uh, I'm excited to chat with you guys about Frontiers of Medical AI and some of the work that we're doing here at Salesforce around therapeutics and workflows. I don't think I have to tell this group um, the importance of therapeutics and workflows in the American healthcare system. Um, and as far as AI applications and medicine go, these are two particular areas that uh, I'm very passionate about. I find that not only do they make for really interesting research projects, but there's a translational component on the back end that's uh, much easier than a lot of the work that's been done in other areas, such as uh, diagnostics and screening. Uh, our forward-looking statements, which Salesforce makes me put on every presentation I give, um, and uh, our agenda for what we'll be chatting about. So uh, on the AF for therapeutic side, we're going to chat about two research areas um, here at Salesforce. One is around therapeutic uh, decision making, uh, specifically uh, precision medicine or personalized medicine. Um, and the other is around therapeutic design. It's project Progen, uh, short for protein generation, in which we've trained AI models to conditionally generate proteins um, for downstream applications. And on the workflow optimization side, we actually have several projects in flight today. I'm going to chat about a COVID search engine that we recently built. So this is a um, a search engine over the uh, COVID literature that's intended to be specific to literature that's not yet highly cited. Uh, and so it doesn't rank high, uh, but it's still very important to, uh, you know, the decisions that are being made on an ongoing basis. Uh, so Q and A, as I said, please just, uh, this is interactive. Don't, don't be shy, just, just uh, ask away. Um, before we get started with all of that, the, the societal impacts of medical AI is, is a topic that is very top of mind uh, for us here at Salesforce and, and its ethical implications. So we've actually uh, taken part in, um, so, so I've served on a series of committees that have helped to set guidelines for AI in medicine. Um, some of those are listed here, Spirit, Consort, Quadus, Tripod, Decide. These are acronyms that refer to, okay, how do we use AI in say clinical trials reporting, clinical trials protocols? Um, how do we think about quality assessment? How do we think about uh, HCI, the, the interaction between some user, a, a physician, and um, 
and AI in the background, how we think about diagnostic reporting. Uh, there's all been a ton of diagnostic studies published, thousands at this point in the last few years. Um, and the key questions and considerations that, that we like to think about are who gets access to, to medical AI? Is it the best hospitals that uh, have the best data sets? Um, or is it the very under-resourced hospitals that, that might not have the best data sets or the best infrastructure in which it might be more error prone to deploy medical AI? Um, inclusivity is a big topic to think about. Is it ethical to approve an AI if there are demographics that it's not effective on yet? Here's a controversial question. Suppose an AI only works on Caucasian males. Do you deploy it? There's a lot of them. But then you're being, you're not being inclusive of everyone else, but you might be able to benefit one demographic. Um, how strict must our standards be? How do you judge an AI? Uh, at the moment, uh, there are best very subjective ways of judging the performance of position, and we don't, uh, at least not in a standardized way. But AI is will. So, so what, what is the bar that an AI must pass? Um, and who's liable if an AI makes a mistake? Uh, so, so we like to kind of keep these things in mind and, and serve on, on these international committees uh, to help guide the field as well. Okay, so, so in the space of AI, AI for therapeutics, let's start off by talking about um, precision medicine and how we can personalize therapies with AI. The impact of personalizing medicine overstated in my opinion um, this is a poll that you're looking at uh, from Business Insider. Companies were asked, which five categories of health IT do you anticipate will have the most impact on health systems five years from now? And in large U.S. health systems were polled. AI for precision medicine was actually at the very top of this list, above consumer technologies, genomics, AI for imaging, telemedicine, and so forth. Um, it's very challenging, uh, and if you're not familiar with the term precision medicine, you have a patient, what's the best therapy for them? That is precision medicine. So rather than blanket medicine, it's, it's precise to and, and personalized to an individual. There's a lot of issues that result from uh, having sort of these blanket prescriptions. And if you can use AI to personalize therapies, you can improve patient outcomes, you can reduce cost, um, and there's all sorts of benefits. Um, you can target tumors with greater accuracy. Uh, I mean, it really is a very exciting area, and it's not. Uh, it's there's very much an unmet need right now uh, to, to deploy AI for precision medicine purposes. We've started at Salesforce in the space of prostate cancer, um, for for the simple reason that it is the most prominent cancer in men uh, in the United States. Uh, there's 175,000 cases, uh, new cases every single year. Um, and it's the second deadliest after lung, lung cancer. Moreover, thanks to the philanthropy of our leadership, so Mark Benioff donated something like 35 to $50 million to UCSF and other institutions um, to uh, find therapies for prostate cancer. His, his father passed away from prostate cancer. And so thanks to that, uh, and of course the young men need in prostate cancer, there's a lot of data that we now have access to that allow us to um, begin answering some really interesting questions here around personalizing therapies in this space. And we've also started to work on breast cancer, which is uh, the most, the highest incident cancer in women. Globally, if we zoom outside of the US, uh, prostate cancer is a major health issue worldwide. In 2020, there were 1.4 million people diagnosed with it. Uh, and over a quarter million died of prostate cancer, nearly 400,000. Um, and what's particularly exciting about AI here is that the tools that currently exist just aren't scalable. There's people in low-income countries which will never have access to modern tools. Modern tools here basically means either genomics or some of the world's best physicians, but they could easily have access to AI-based tools. And so if we can recreate or improve on existing wet lab-based assays uh, by having you know, digital AI-based assays um, that are immediate and scalable, there's a lot of good you can do in underserved areas. The green uh, here shows uh, the incidence in males. So as you can see in North America, South America, Australia, and Africa, it is the highest incidence, uh, incident cancer. Um, and mortality-wise, uh, this is actually the, the worst cancer in Africa and parts of uh, North America and South America as well. The current standard of care 
for, uh, for the space is actually a combination of physicians and genomic tests. So the NCCN, the National Comprehensive Cancer Network, publishes guidelines every year for how to treat prostate cancer and really every other cancer. Um, the Cypher is a, is a genomics company, you know, insurance reimbursed for all non-metastatic uh, prostate cancer. And there's a number of other tests, Oncotype, Prolaris, Promark, um, that are validated in low and intermediate risk patients as well. This plus uh, sort of clinical variables that, that the NCCN also publishes has set the standard of care. And you measure the effectiveness using an RC AUC curve, uh, which I assume you're all familiar with. Please let me know if you're not. Um, of uh, the sensitivity and one minus the specificity of the, uh, the classifier's performance. Um, and AUC of 0.5, as we know, is, is useless. Um, in this space, an AUC between 0 0.7 and 0 0.8 is considered um, uh, quite acceptable. And anything above 0 0.8, which hasn't really been achieved, uh, is, is what folks are shooting for. The best clinical models, and here clinical models is a, is a doctor. A clinical model basically means you take three variables about a patient, their, uh, two scores about their cancer and one score from a, from a blood marker. Um, you do some math and you get a, a, a decision on how to treat a patient. So that'll give you an AUC that's between 0 0.6 and 0 0.7, depending on the patient data set. The best genomic tools will push the envelope on that about 0.1. Um, but the best genomic tools uh, often also work on prostatectomy data, meaning you remove the prostate and then sequence it. So you get the entire uh, prostate in your sample. Nobody wants to do that. If you take a biopsy of the prostate and come up with a test, that's much, much better. So there's limitations here as well to consider. And the impact of predicting a future outcome is substantial. So uh, this is a Kaplan-Meier analysis of a biomarker. Uh, what you're looking at um, on the right-hand side. Uh, Andre, can I ask a quick question? Yeah, by all means. Um, so what is the task that you're um, measuring the effectiveness for? Is it diagnosis or is it like um, mortality prediction? and which of these tasks is more relevant for like a, a classifier to, to perform well on, in your opinion? That's a good question. So, so it's not diagnosis. This is, um, it's not diagnostic. It's a prognostic or a predictive uh, decision. So um, the, the outcomes that are key here are like distant metastasis, uh, biochemical recurrence. Um, biochemical recurrence basically means that so there's, there's this thing called PSA, prostate-specific antigen, um, which is a hormone produced by the prostate and correlated with negative outcomes. Hormone therapies, um, which work fairly well, suppress PSA levels, in addition to suppressing a number of other hormones, which help to reduce uh, the size of the cancer. If those PSA levels skyrocket and they go back up, that is considered recurrence, uh, biochemical recurrence. So that's the second outcome that's measured. Uh, Disease-specific mortality, and then overall survival. Those are the four key outcomes. Most of these results, actually these numbers here, are computed from distant metastasis, which is the primary endpoint for our, our prostate cancer tools. I see, okay, thank you. <laughs> you bet. So if we can use, actually, let me back up. The plot you're looking at here on the right is uh, the non-failure rate or the success rate over time from uh, t equals zero where patients are randomized. So this is the, this, this is the result of a randomized trial. The patient court, you split them in half. You put one half on short-term androgen uh, deprivation therapy plus radiotherapy. So that's, that's a fancy way of saying hormone therapy and radiotherapy over a short amount of time. And you put the other half on long-term hormone therapy and radiotherapy. And you get these survival curves. So the, the long-term group uh, has a higher success rate than the short-term group. But if you read between the lines, quite literally, what these plots show is that this patient population denoted by the green arrow was fine, would have been fine with short-term hormone therapy. And you want, to be on, you want the least intense therapy possible because these therapies are horribly damaging to the body. It's like chemo, right? It ravages the body. Um, so the, the patient's noted by the green arrow would have been fine with short-term hormone therapy. The, the patients in, in denoted by the blue arrow 
did benefit from the longer term home therapy. Short term means four months, long term means 24 months. So going from four months to two years benefits a small number of patients. But there's about half of the patients in this randomized trial shown in red that still failed in spite of the long-term therapy. Uh, they either needed to be on a more intense therapy or on a different therapy entirely. And so if we can predict which patients won't respond to existing treatments or will respond better to one or the other, there's a huge opportunity to improve outcomes. The, everyone in, in, denoted by the red arrow died uh, in this group. Um, of course, cost is by um, a reasonably priced test is scalable and reduce the cost of unnecessary therapies. The access is much better. Um, you can ship an AI test basically anywhere and you improve quality of care. So we've given some thought on, on how you can take a tool like this and become the standard of care. Um, you know, uh, physicians form the foundation here and they, they follow guidelines published by the NCCN to take a patient and predict the patient's outcome. Uh, these are rules-based guidelines using uh, three different clinical variables, sometimes five. They're updated annually and they define physician performance. What's really nice is you can generate AUC curves by uh, coding up uh, this, this set of rules. Genomic tests, which really came about in the last 10 to 15 years, um, sort of form the, the, the layer over physicians. Um, they're about $4,000 to run. It takes several weeks. Uh, and it, on average, it's taken about seven years to develop these assays. The, the leading company in the prostate space took 10 years um, and the tens of millions of dollars to, to develop their assay using a small set of patients, you know, less than 2,000. And this was a whole commercial endeavor. In contrast, an AI test, which we hope forms the next generation of uh, medical tests for, for you know, prognostic and predictive biomarkers, um, is, is essentially zero in cost. It's, a, it's an AI. It can absorb more uh, richer data, I should say. Uh, we currently are using 30 clinical variables um, and tens of pathology slides for each patient. Um, and also the data is more robust. In our data, so we're actually working with 15,000 uh, patients and it's easy to acquire more data and merge it in. This data additionally has long-term follow-up. Um, the genomics tests were designed based on uh, medium-term follow-up, 10-year timescales. We've actually been able to acquire 20-year uh, follow-up in our data set. And so this is essentially ground truth. We know if you take this patient and give them this therapy, what will happen to them in 20 years? Our results so far are quite promising, and actually these numbers um, have improved uh, since, uh, since I first put together this, this deck. Um, you see the, the three key models on the left, physicians, genomic tests, and uh, salesforce.com. That's what SFDC stands for. So it's the, the model we built internally. And you, you're looking at two outcomes over two time frames. So one outcome is DM, distant metastasis. It's the most important one. And the other outcome is a PSA recurrence. So this is biochemical recurrence. You applied hormone therapy, it didn't work, and the, you know, the, the PSA levels went back up in the patient. And the two important time endpoints are five and 10 years. This is how clinicians like to, to make judgments. Physicians um, predicting five-year distant metastasis will get you an AUC of 0 0.67. Um, genomic test boosts that up to 0 0.74. We currently actually, we're no longer 0 0.76, we're now 0 0.79. So we managed to push the envelope further. Um, and we're good about 0.1 in AUC above physicians and about 0 0.05 above uh, genomic tests. But uh, what you can see from, um, from this table is that we're consistently better than physicians. And this isn't at all something that replaces what a physician does. This is very much complementary to, um, to their workflow and it gets embedded very easily into their workflow. Physicians already have uh, physical slides of a patient's tumor, it's, it's part of the diagnosis. All they need to do is digitize those slides up from them to a cloud server and they get back a test uh, immediately. And for these other endpoints, we're, uh, we're again about 0.1 in AUC above the level of performance of a physician. Now, um, also in the AI therapeutic space, but much earlier in the development cycle, uh, we've been working on a project, a really exciting project in protein engineering. Uh, so proteins, um, as, as you all know, are kind of the, the workhorses of biology. This is not data, this is just an animation. 
um, that serve a number of biological functions uh, that are dependent on the structure of the protein. And there's, you know, infinitely many different kinds of proteins that you can generate from a string of amino acids um, with amino acid sequences varying in, in length. Um, there, there's, there's literally infinitely, infinitely many possibilities. And the structure of a protein is completely dependent on two things, the order of uh, or the sequence of amino acids in that protein and the thermodynamics and kinetics that cause that sequence to fold uh, into a protein. So um, as I just mentioned, a, a, a protein is a, is a sequence of amino acids that has been folded. So here's an example of structure. Um, and what you're looking at here is, is that uh, sort of a, is an animation of a helicase um, being formed. And protein design is a, one of the kind of one of the grand challenges in science. Some of you may have um, may have read about alpha fold and alpha fold two, the ability to now take an existing um, protein and sort of a, a predict its structure using an AI, uh, as opposed to having to apply a X-ray crystallography, which was a very expensive process. What we're trying to do is kind of a step before that. Uh, designing the, the amino acid sequence to have downstream function of a particular type. And there's a wide range of applications here. There's drug discovery, of course, but there's also industrial materials, food, agriculture, and current methods in biology tend to be very slow and efficient and expensive. They're all wet lab based. So can we use um, you know, AI to accelerate the design? There's been an exponential growth in protein sequence database. And so there's a lot of rich data out there. You see this here on the right. The number of sequences has, has really blown up in the last 10 years. Then, excuse me, the number of proteins that have been sequenced are now in the hundreds of millions, if not billions. Uh, but the number of proteins that, whose, whose structures are known is, is only in the hundreds of thousands because it's incredibly expensive. Prior to AlphaFold 2, it was very, very expensive to figure out the structure of a protein. Um, and this has largely been due to dramatic reduction in DNA sequencing uh, cost. So the more that you can do just based off of a protein sequence, um, the better off you are in terms of protein design. And there's been a lot of, in conjunction with a lot of advances in, in NLP, as you all know, um, capabilities here include very realistic text generation and very effective transfer learning. You know, taking these massive language corpuses, um, pre-training transformer models and then um, in an unsupervised way and then being able to fine tune them on very small amounts of data to generate very realistic text. And so there's, there's this, you, we have this idea of kind of combining these two areas. So, so doing unsupervised learning on massive amounts of protein sequences and then developing ways of conditionally generating proteins the same way that we can conditionally generate text. In a conditional language model, um, your essential uh, conditional generation is based on what are called control codes that govern the style, the content, uh, and the task specific behavior of the model. So suppose you have a text corpus and a language model. Um, you can you have associated metadata as control codes that, that you can um, tune, that you can specify, and you'll get conditional language generation from that. As an example, and we published this a couple of years ago, um, paper called Control. Uh, suppose that you're given two keywords, horror and a knife. So a knife is kind of the, the starting uh, sequence. A model uh, given the control code horror will output a bit of text like what you see at the top. A knife handle pulled through the open hole in front, I jump on the knife, hit, eyes widen in horror. It reads like a the trailer of a movie. If the control code is now reviews, then you have the re uh, review of a kitchen knife. A knife is a tool and this one does the job well, rating 4.0, I bought these from my husband and so on and so forth. So these control codes tune the output of the classifier and they're hand specified. And so the, the basic idea is to combine this, th these ideas here, where you can take, uh, so, so we, we train pro it's a conditional language and protein design. It's done near 300 million sequences with metaphor or, or, or reviews. Uh, but in, the biologic, in a biological context, it's like the, uh, the, the organism, the function, the location, the process, the amino acid, and so forth. 
you give those control codes to a, a generation model and it outputs a, excuse me, it outputs a sequence. Um, from that sequence, you can then actually uh, create these proteins um, in a wet lab. They'll fold and have some structure and then they have some downstream function. Th that is the basic idea. Uh, and in a collaboration with Stanford and, and, and UCSF, uh, we've used language model metrics to, to validate this. We've used biometrics, uh, bioinformatics metrics to validate this uh, and biophysical metrics as well. Um, and so now we've been looking into lab validation. Do these progen design proteins actually work in the real world? And it's unpublished as of yet, but the short answer is that in some constrained use cases, yes, they do. We've actually been able to generate um, antibacterial proteins uh, fairly well. Uh, and there's a lot of use cases for, for this kind of technology beyond just protein generation. Um, Certainly you can use them to design proteins not found in nature as well as you know, making adjustments to proteins that are found in nature. You can do AI guided protein optimization um, over very sort of coarse landscapes as shown here on the right. Uh, and you can do protein variant ranking. You can predict the, the protein fitness of mutations without experimental data. So given a protein, if you were to mutate it slightly, what would happen to it is a very expensive question to answer. Biologically, they're inexpensive to answer in silica. And finally, um, okay, good, I'm still good on time. Let's talk about workflow um, optimization, AI and medical workflows, and specifically specialized search. Uh, the, the idea of AI and medical workflows it was a big idea. There's a lot of different workflows that AI could impact from, uh, from a bunch of radiology use cases to general uh, hospital optimization of, of you know, supplies and organization and scheduling and so forth and patient ingestion um, and revenue cycle management and all this. Um, one area that we're particularly interested in is in specialized search. Salesforce actually offers a number of enterprise search functions when you have to search over a very proprietary corpus that can't be open sourced. And we took a lot of those ideas and we created a specialized search engine for COVID. We actually started working on this right when COVID hit um, and uh, papers just started being published like crazy about coronaviruses in general. It's a paper uh, which we call Coast Search. This is COVID-19 information retrieval. And it was based off of a Kaggle competition, actually. So um, about a year ago, the White House, the Allen Institute, CZI, and a number of other very prominent medical and research institutions, medical and AI institutions, they got together and they formed what they called the COVID-19 Open Research Dataset Challenge, the Core 19 Challenge. And the goal was very broad. It was to apply NLP to the growing corpus of uh, COVID-related literature, which in March of last year was 30,000 papers. In March of this year was 400,000 papers, greater than 10x increase, just absolutely remarkable. Thousands of papers were published every single week um, on, on COVID. And so when you have a new paper, which might be very relevant to medical decision-making and uh, you know, population health, that new paper isn't yet gonna rank highly uh, on Google search or other traditional search engines because they're all based on these graphs. Uh, CNN ranks highly because it's pointed to by all these other websites. Papers tend to rank highly because they're very cited. So there's this inherent time lag that exists um, in the normal search engines to allow work to mature. When COVID hit, you don't have that luxury. You need to be able to find papers that, were, that are relevant that were published yesterday. And so the, the basic uh, goal for us was to do exactly that. Um, there, there's a competition called uh, Trek, which actually arose. Oops, what's happening here? There we go. There was a competition called Trek COVID, which was a sort of a derived from the COVID-19 challenge for search engines in particular. Trek is, um, is a conference on information retrieval and uh, they partnered with Core 19 to, to create um, a specialized challenge for search engines. And they put together a bunch of queries and they had human annotators go in and um, annotate uh, relevant documents to queries. Here's, here's one example. So, so one such query is coronavirus mental health impact. Uh, and they have that in various different forms. It's in the form of a question, of a narrative. You've got 
example articles shown right below that. And they put together a number of these for the competition. And so we derived a method um, that, uh, that the key insight here was, was, was really around semantic search, which would allow you to disambiguate subtleties in word ordering, which would be very important in a biological context. Um, we still leverage to some degree kind of traditional information retrieval techniques that, that deal with graphs and deal with um, sort of the citation graphs that, that appear when you have a very highly cited work. But the, we actually had to change our thinking from that sort of thinking to how do we find important literature based strictly on the content of a paper as opposed to its relation to a broader corpus. And so we put together semantic search, which allowed you to disambiguate subtle T's and word ordering, which are really important in biology. So, so here's one example. What regulates expression of the ACE2 protein versus what does the ACE2 protein regulate are syntactically nearly identical, semantically incredibly different. And normal search engines would struggle with this. And as a result, would have to fall back on citation graphs, which we don't have the luxury of in the COVID world. And so what we did was we generated a sort of uh, pseudo corpus to be able to train semantic search from the existing corpus. And that pseudo corpus was uh, created by taking the publications, um, 30,000 or and eventually they're pouring a thousand, breaking them up into paragraphs and for each paragraph peeling out its citations. And that induces a graph in which the tuples of paragraph and, and citations actually form training tuples. You could input them to something like a Siamese BERT network, which is trained to predict the correspondence between the content of a paragraph and the titles of what it cites. So now you know that there's a correspondence between one paper and another. Um, and uh, so then what you could do is, is uh, train a model to predict this correspondence and uh, repurpose it to take as input a query and a document and identify if those two correspond. Built on that idea, we actually ended up putting together a whole system architecture um, whose framework is based on, on traditional search methods in, in which you first take a corpus of documents, you index them, then you take a query and you retrieve some set of documents and then you rank that set of documents and you surface the top 20 or whatever the case might be. And the, the key difference was that built on top of traditional framework, we layered in semantic search. So in the in part A, in the indexing part, you take your document corpus and you use traditional keyword ba keyword based techniques shown here. Uh, if you're familiar with the literature, this is BM25 and TF-IDF. So um, very keyword based techniques, uh, term frequency, inverse document frequency is what TF-IDF stands for. Um, the general intuition is that words that are more rare are more relevant. So we combine that with uh, semantic search based on paragraphs, their citations, and the, the captions and images and so forth to create these kind of joint embeddings. Index them. And then in part B, uh, you know, when, when a query comes in from the user, you run that query through each of these modules, through TF-IDF, SBIRT, the semantic search, and BM25. Um, and then you combine the resultant retrieved lists to get a a retrieved set of documents. And then beyond that, we actually put together two additional modules, one that's a question answering module, and a, a second, which is an abstract summarizer, and use those to further rank the set of documents. So the Q&A model would basically take the query and the, the retrieved set of documents and predict answers. Um, the abstract summarizer would take the retrieved set of documents and actually summarize them. And then you would use these two pieces of text, the, the answers of the Q&A model and uh, the, uh, the summarized versions of these documents to further rank the retrieved documents such that documents would float up higher if they answered the query um, and if the summarized versions were similar to the query somehow. Uh, and that yields a final set of documents which you return to the user. Uh, and we actually did fairly well uh, on the competition here. So this is the, the first round of the competition. What you look at are very difficult to, to judge. 
for the, the simple reason that if you think about the, the space of possible queries and the number of documents, um, th there is an astronomical number of sets of retrieved documents that you can get for each possible query, even in a fixed number of queries. And so annotating that, uh, that uh, huge set is, is intractable. Instead, what you end up doing is you annotate a small subset of it, and then you use a series of different metrics to, to grade. So BPREF stands for binary preference, which uh, is the most annotation agnostic metric. MAP is mean average precision. Precision at five is whether or not the top five documents are, are relevant. Precision 10 is whether or not the top 10 documents are relevant, and so on and so forth. Uh, the, the details of, of what these scores are isn't particularly relevant. Um, there, what, what's a little bit more relevant is a comparison between the kinds of search engines, which you see on the left side and on the right side. So you could submit to this competition one of three different kinds of search engines. Um, one, one of those is, is what was called uh, automatic, um, in which the search engine did not include a user. And, and the other two did include the user. So, so the user could sit there and iteratively adjust the query to get better results. <laughs> and secondly, you can create a metrics of performance based on all pairs of, of query documents, uh, which are 1.53 million, and like I said, intractable to annotate, or just the judged pairs that were a result of humans coming in and annotating that small subset. You'll get much better performance <laughs> if you compare it to just those in your category and just the annotated subset of data. And on that set of data, we actually ranked in the top. Uh, we, we, were, we were best in class with the scores that you see listed there. That placed us near best in class for these other metrics and uh, ranked number two for BPREF. The reason we were so different between BPREF and these other metrics, now like I said, BPREF is the most annotation agnostic uh, method is because the annotations are actually, there's a circularity here where annotations come from the results of competitors in the, uh, in, the, in the competition. And so if you have a whole bunch of submissions that you say keyword-based techniques, you're gonna get annotations on keyword-based retrieved documents. Since we were using semantic search, our retrieve results, though very relevant, were actually very different from the annotated subset. And so for that reason, you end up, um, having these, this multi-dimensional uh, set of metrics for, for judging the performance of a system. Uh, scaled across you know, the five rounds of the competition, you can see the results here. So we managed to stay in first or second place for the first three rounds. Uh, for rounds four and five, we dropped a bit because at that point you could start using feedback and, and uh, the annotations of prior rounds to, to fine tune in a supervised way your existing models, but, but overall, this community is highly collaborative and, and what we all ended up doing was open sourcing our work and then building it on, on top of itself. Um, uh, information retrieval engines can very easily be combined. Um, you just take the retrieve sets of documents in multiple engines and, and combine them intelligently and you have a new search engine. And so uh, it's actually been a really great experience working with a, an entirely different community on this very important problem. We published this in Nature Digital Med just a couple months ago. Um, and uh, there's a demo running at Einstein AI slash COVID if anybody would like to take a look. And with that, uh, I'll open it up for, for questions, discussion, comments, violent protests, this sort of thing. Thank you, Andre, for the excellent talk. So yeah, everyone, please um, feel free to ask questions now. Okay, um, actually, I have one question. Um, so it's like, I would like to know um, your opinion about um, deploying AI models to the real world clinical settings. Like how, how do you think the researchers can, uh, what they can do to build the trust between um, the clinicians as well as the, the models itself or the, yeah, the AI um, researchers? So, uh, I'm hearing two questions. Um, how do we think about deployment and how do we build trust? When we think about deployment, I think probably the most important thing is to deeply understand that the workflow. 
the workflow of the user. Uh, you don't want to disrupt medical workflow. Doctors are already super stressed out. They're working with seven, like 70 different IT systems, uh, none of which communicate and none of which are particularly modern. Um, and so it's very, very difficult to have any disruption to an already uh, very eccentric workflow. So you want to make sure that you're embedded well into what they're already doing. And you're not asking them to do something that's very, very different or disruptive. Uh, in terms of how you build trust, uh, well, there's multiple ways to think about this. Validation studies are great, not just on some retrospective data set, but in a prospective workflow setting where you deploy the algorithm, track its, um, uh, its utility, track its performance. Um, you want to make sure that you show uh, bias uh, results, uh, bias analysis, uh, and that you've got, you know, data coming from multiple centers and multiple demographics that you are somehow validated on say the set of patients that they might be seeing in rural Arkansas or whatever their case might be. Um, can be really effective ways of, of understanding the, the general opinion and feeling towards the utility of the tool. Great, thanks. Is um, there any other questions? Yeah, um, I had one question. So, um, in the COVID work, for instance, I, th I thought that's a really great example of like making the use case. Um, like it's a really good use case. And I was wondering if you also had a chance to like try it on non-COVID uh, related queries also. Like I'm sure that will be useful in any kind of um, situation, not necessarily COVID related. So just wanted to know if, if you had any validation studies or something on other data sets. Yeah, um, but we can open source our work and there is a running demo. So you're welcome to. If there's a as if there's a corpus of you know relevant to another disease site, it'd be really interesting to see how this performs. Okay, thank you. you bet. Uh, hi Andrew, may I ask a question? Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks uh, so much for the a great presentation. So I'm really interested about the first project on the uh, yeah the personalized the re uh, therapy for the cancer patients. So I wonder that uh, based on the current model that you train with multimodality data, have your or your team uh, have tried to apply this uh, this model or this methodology to the real cancer patients in the clinics to design the personalized the treatment for uh, for the real patients. And the second question is that beyond like the radiation therapy, so uh, what kind of the different treatment for the cancer patients are included in this model, like the chemotherapy or the uh, target drugs or yeah, this kind of the other uh, common cancer uh, treatment in the clinics? Uh, so to your first question, we have mm -hmm. not yet tried this on real patients, uh, but uh, we're working on it. Yeah, um, yeah. The first step is to publish these validation studies, and then we'll actually go and run IRB approved studies next. Oh. Um, and uh, as far as the, the treatments, mm -hmm. uh, our current data set comprises radiotherapy and hormone therapy. Mm -hmm. uh, we have an additional data set arriving that includes uh, prostatectomies, so surgical removal of the prostate, um, mm -hmm. uh, as well as uh, chemotherapy. Mm -hmm. For oh yeah yeah cool yeah i think yeah because uh, i i totally feel this kind of the uh, personalized treatment will make a very large big a very big difference for all the cancer patients so very excited to see that how it could work yeah for the different cancer patients and yeah looking forward to the updates on that thank you so much you bet yeah and no, we're very very excited about uh, that particular point mm -hmm. i mean if you take a look at um this one here, where did it go? This is really in the presentation, the Kalmyer curves. I mean, this plot, when it was first shown to me by, this plot basically says, look, we put these patients on the, you know, the two best therapies we could think of mm -hmm. for this set of patients. And half of them died. Just right on that for a second. How these patients died, which means half of these patients didn't need to be on these two therapies. They mm -hmm. either needed to be in a different trial or on a different combination of therapies or, or something different needed to occur. So if we can use AI to find those patients, that's huge. That's absolutely yeah, huge. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, really good for the patient, good for the system, and so forth. Yeah, 
Yeah, yeah, right. I also talk with some cancer patients, um, and some of them really have to. I, I know this is may not be guided by the doctors, but they really try to design the personalized treatment by themselves according to their experience. So, like for the chemotherapy, they may have mixed the chemotherapy with the target drugs, uh, just inter, uh, internally. So to to get to just uh, yeah, they feel that this may be a better way than the official guidance by the doctors. So I think if there is that kind of AI model, that's that will be really very very helpful for these patients. Yeah, yep. thank you so much. We we feel the same way. Yeah. Is there any other questions? Okay, if not, let's um, thank, thank Andre with uh, some virtual applause. Thank you so much for the great talk. And we'll be uploading the talk on our YouTube channel later today. If anyone has uh, further questions, feel free to post them under the YouTube video or on the Google phone on our website. We'll follow up on it later. Great. All right. Thanks again, Andre. And thank you everyone for joining us today. We'll see you next Thursday. Thanks, Andre. Thanks, Mandy. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Andre. Bye-bye.